Hi. Uh, it's been a little while since I have recorded any watercolor videos. Um, I did them mostly when I was up in Daytona helping my mom out after she fell and broke her hip. Um, they were quite helpful for my class at Mount's Botanical Garden and what I've decided to do is I've started a second class each week on Thursdays in Lake Worth, Florida and that's a beginner's class. We're starting from the very nuts and bolts in the beginning and I have decided to do a weekly video that goes along with that class for anyone who misses the class as an option for being able to have some continuity. It also makes it possible for people to come and go because not everybody can make it every week. So this is the very first one for the beginner series. They will be on my YouTube channel and there will be um, a special area for the beginners classes. They'll be open to all, but just so you know, they're there. Um, first thing I want to talk about before we get into the lessons objectives for this first class, which is about watercolor washes, I wanted to talk about the watercolors themselves and what we'll be doing today. So I've got water, two containers, um, a pint cup or even a little bit bigger is good. The bigger the better so that you don't get your dirty water too dirty when you're washing out your brush. The idea of two is that you always take your dirty brush that you've just finished with and go into the dirty one and then rinse it off in the clean one and pick up your water from the clean one so that you always have clean water going into your palette so that you don't contaminate your wash. Um, it's pretty simple, um, keeps your palette cleaner, um, and it's just the right way to work. Um, it'll help keep your paintings fresh and not get muddy. So that's uh, tip number one. Um, you can work with pan watercolors like these. These are made by Core. Um, I always say QOR. They're from um, the Golden Paintworks in New Berlin, New York. Uh, so they make the golden acrylics. Um, this little 12 color set I love. I've had it for a couple of years. This is my travel buddy when I do urban sketching, when I go on vacation. The colors work great together. It's very hard to make mud. They're super saturated, super strong colors, so you don't need a lot. I really can't say enough about this set. Um, I'll probably be working from this one for our demo. On this bigger palette, this is the one I use in the studio. Um, and I have two of these. I have one set up with the tube form of the QOR paints and one with these. These are American Journey by Cheap Joe's in North Carolina. Um, for the As far as the mail order art supply companies go, I like Cheap Joe's a lot. Their home brand of paints, the American Journey, um, really, really nice colors. You get a really big tube and a lot of paint, um, so they're worth they're worth the money, and they are good, good, good paints. I have no problem recommending them. Um, this is my mixing palette. Um, this one is ceramic, and what I like about this one. It might be a little heavy for my bag, but I tend to take it out with me because it's got nice, deep wells. Beginners tend to make the mistake of not mixing up enough paint or mixing it too strong because they have it in too small an area. I really like this because one of the things, um, the next tip about watercolor for you guys is always mix twice as much paint as you think you're going to need because if you're doing a wash and it's over a large area, it's going to dry before you can mix more paint and get the right color mixed if you have to stop to mix fresh paint. So always try to have more than you think you're going to need ready and available for you. It's just the easiest way to do these things. Um, and ultimately, the amount of paint you use to fill that up is inexpensive. And you can always let it dry on your palette and just add water to it and use it again so you're not wasting paint. So for this demo, we're going to do washes and I'm going to use the QOR paints and this little palette. You won't be able to see it because I'm going to switch the camera over. Um, so we're going to just be looking at the painting in progress. Go through how to make each one and why are they important? The wash is the 
Um, the wash is the basic building block of watercolor. Um, every one of the shapes that you might draw out ahead of time, say it's petals on a flower and the stem and the background leaves or a studio still life, any of these things, any of these components that you break into a shape, that shape is a wash and you're going to treat it as one thing, whether it's your background or a picture in a still life, you're going to work. That's your basic cellular unit, let's say. And there are different kinds. The solid wash is exactly that. You want to get a solid field of color uh, that doesn't change. Think of a summer sky that's a really blue sky that doesn't fade at the horizon. They're pretty rare, but um, they can be very exciting in a painting that has a lot of other stuff going on or in a big painting. Um, the solid wash can be achieved two ways. One on dry paper and one where you wet the paper first. I'll do it on dry paper, but the concept is exactly the same, except that you brush on clear water first. Um, it's a handy wash to be able to have and to be able to control. Once you can control getting a clean wash down in one solid color, you're, you're home to doing everything else. This is something that you should do several times. Um, it'll help you get used to how much paint you need with your water and how your paper takes up the paint, um, which is also an important factor. In case, in case you're wondering, this piece of paper is Hominul. It's a German company. It's 140 pound, which I think is 300 GSM. They go by either one of those. And it's cold pressed. I like this paper because it's sized on the surface. The paper's a little bit slow to take the paint in. Gives you a little bit of time to do corrections, which I like a lot. Um, can be handy later if you want to lift out some color. And what else can I tell you about it? Um, it's a good paper that I only just started using. And before that, I used Arches. And I like Arches very much. I recommend for all my beginning students to use 140 pound cold press. That should be until you get really comfortable with one brand and one type of paper, continue to use the same one until you know how it's going to react. Then you can switch over and start using other papers for other effects like rough paper, which has got more texture than cold press works really well for dry brush techniques and um, a lot of textured effects. Hot press um, is used by illustrators mostly, um, but some watercolorists and a lot of floral watercolorists like it a lot. So you'll find which one you want, but I would say start with 140 pound cold press because what I'm trying to do is give you easy wins at first. Um, it's important that so you don't get discouraged that you get to know your tools and use the right tools to start with. Another tool you want to get familiar with is obviously your brush. Today, for our washes, I'm going to use a number 12, which is a pretty big round brush. And I like round brushes for washes. Um, you can also use a one inch flat, something like that. Um, I tend to get less streaking with the round brush, so that's the one I'm going to use. And uh, it should have a good belly on it be a pretty good size it should come to a point when it's wet so that it can get into small nooks and crannies because not everything is about rectangles like this but let's dive in and do our first wash and the first thing i'm going to do is wet my wet my brush and get some some water into that well and then i'm going to pick up some dioxazine purple I like saying dioxazine purple, and I like purple. Purple is one of my favorite colors in watercolor. Purple and green can do a lot together. And notice I am mixing a fair amount. I don't want to run out in the middle of the demo because that would be bad. Um, and I'm going to mix it strong enough. And... Now, the key to doing the flat wash is to get in, 
your brush should be nice and wet. You want, I'm working at an angle, which works really well for a wet wash like this. And you can see that the paint is pooling up at the bottom of the wash. The key is to then go back from the other side and continue and always keep that, that edge wet. We call that the bead and this is the key to the flat wash. And I know this can seem like paint, watching paint dry, but honestly, if you guys get this down and get good at these basics, you won't get frustrated later. You won't be asking me, why won't my paper take the paint? Why does this look so thin? All those questions. If you practice doing these, it'll be very worth your time. I wish I had done more practice on these when I first started, but I was a stubborn student who wanted to go out and paint lighthouses and waterfalls right away. And I did, but I made a lot of really bad ones. Okay, now, so I'm going to do this just so that it doesn't run under my tape. And by the way, this tape is, is just Home Depot painter's tape. Where this is pulling up at the bottom of the wash, you can dry out your brush on some paper towel. I always keep some paper towel right by my work area. And just run it along the bottom because gravity is still going to force that paint into there. Uh, so that's done on dry. If I had done it on water, it would have been a little bit easier even because the paint would have soaked directly into the water that was already there and it would flow a little better. Um, the downside to using a flat wash where you pre-wet the paper is that you're diluting your paint color so you have to go in darker. So it really comes down to what you're comfortable with um, as far as which way you want to do it. Okay, this paper is still a little bit hard for you guys to see it, but it's still shiny. When the paper is shiny, when you're doing watercolor, you can still add paint to it. Once it gets dull, you really can't. It's just not going to work. Excuse me, you will get a blossom, um, which is an ugly run back they can be great for texture work sometimes, but when you have it in the middle of what's supposed to be a flat wash, it'll break your heart. And it's because your brush is wetter than the paper that the paint is on. And when you touch it, the water will flow out of the brush and into the paint mixture and it won't mix well. It'll be a, a crinkly kind of blossom. It's something that we try to avoid in watercolor. All right, now, we're going to do the same thing, We're going to, but this time we're going to do the graded wash. And for the graded wash, I am going to load up the, the paper with paint. There's a little bit of purple left on my brush, but don't worry about that. It's all going to get covered. As you can see, I'm coming in and I'm soaking the whole square rectangle. It will accept the paint a little bit easier. And the difference between the graded wash and the flat wash is that it goes from dark at the top or bottom to uh, paper white. And you achieve that by starting the exact same way. And you can see the, the effect of having the paper wet the, the paint runs right down it, right? I'm going to get a little bit more dark up in here and you'll see why in a second. Because now, I rinse off my brush and my, my dirty water, pick up some clean water, and then I continue to paint. I'm going to add a little bit more dark up here in this corner while it's still wet. And I'm going to just pull that away. And the trick here is that you want to end up like this. So it grades from a darker color and this paper is still very, very wet because I wet it first. So I can still come in up in the top and make that color a little bit more pronounced. And 
since it's still wet, I can come in with a little bit more water and get a straighter, straighter effect here. I'm drying out my brush now and I'm just going to collect the, the water that is down at the bottom. And that's the graded wash. Um, one of the nice things is about w all watercolor is unpredictable, but in this case, you, you, you get an organic feel to where the color runs and where it doesn't. If you start with dry paper, like I did on this one, you can get a much more controlled straight across line if that's what you want your grade to be. And this is still gonna continue to fade down for a little while yet. This paper is still very wet and gravity is pulling that pigment down. Um, so that is our graded wash. Um, pretty straightforward. The next one builds on the graded wash and is done. It's a two color wash. So it starts with one color at the top and ends at another at the bottom. And for this, I'm going to grab some orange and I really like this QOR orange. It is a transparent pyrrole orange. If you look at most of the oranges on the market, they are cadmium based. The pigment is cadmium in them and any of the cadmium reds yellows and oranges are all fairly opaque colors this is a nice rich color it's strong strong as can be but it is transparent um, and it mixes really well so now on our bottom left we're going to do our two color wash uh, we'll start again at the top with our purple and I'm simply going to run that across. And it's going to be just like the graded wash. We're going to do a band of purple up at the top. I'll have to mix more purple for our next. Then I can, while the bead is still wet, come in with a wet brush. And it activates that color and runs down. And it's, it's a good thing to do to go across from one side and then back from the other. And this is making a much more even graded wash than that one was because I started from the dry paper. Now at about the two thirds mark, I can pick up the orange and start running the orange across until we get down to the bottom. And gravity again will will lead that down and we may get to the point where they meet um, but there may be a clear line there and this is the basis for a lot of paintings you'll see at the seashore so starting with a sky you'll get to the horizon and you'll paint in your your sand so that would be that whole your whole background done in one wash and then once it's dry, you can put in the sea and change the shoreline and most of your painting is done. Um, these washers are really good at getting the guts of the painting done, um, figuring out where you want to keep your whites and then working around them. Um, the washes are the key to so much in watercolor and spending, spending a couple of hours playing with them in the beginning will be nothing but beneficial for you. You'll be so happy that you did spend that time, especially if you continue on this watercolor journey. Um, which by the way, there will be frustrations. Um, I have painted for a long time now and I know from experience that not everything works. Sometimes you have to figure out how to do the painting you wanna do. So it can be tricky. Um, now let's see. I'm going to mix up another well. I'm going to add some alizarin crimson, which is another transparent color. Um, it's more on the pink rosy side and will go really nicely with these colors. And let's add one more color. Um, I'm going to add French ultramarine blue. Now, one of the things about doing a 
um, a wash that's done in multiple colors, a variegated wash like this, is keep your values about the same. Um, so in this case, I'm actually going to thin down the purple just a little bit so it's not quite as dark. And then they're all in the same value range. And then the easiest way to do a variegated wash is to go ahead and wet the paper first. And then you drop the different colors in together kind of randomly um, and let them play on the paper and mingle. This is my favorite wash to do. Getting them to mix and mingle within a shape can do great things for uninteresting parts of a painting. Um, something to give you something to look at. Um, the, the key is to keep the values about the same. Um, now I said I was going to wet this. So I'm going to get in here and get this paper wet. And I'm pushing on the paper a little bit more when I get using just water than I normally do. I normally dance the brush around on the paper more like this. And I hold it way back here. Don't hold it like a pencil and don't try to choke it. The real key is to um, be light, be light with your touch. And you see how nicely these, these come together and mingle. And the really great thing about it is that I chose ultramarine blue because it's a, it's a blue that's, if you're looking at a color wheel, runs towards the red side. Um, a blue-green might not have worked as well. Um, but the, the fact that the values, the light and dark portion of the colors, are about the same, so you have to do a little bit of planning, um, makes it so that you can still see it as one shape, regardless of which color is where in your wash. Since they are more or less the same light and dark percentage, you can simply put them together. And you can drop in if you don't want to drop. You can pick it up on your brush, get your brush nice and juicy, and tap some new color in. This paper has to be super wet. It's got to be nice and shiny, or this part will not work. But you can do that. You see, I just got... Paint oh, out. That's okay. If you look over here, I splashed over onto that variegated wash. Now the paper is just, just wet enough that that dot is probably not going to show too much. And what I should probably do is just leave it alone. Um, so when you're splashing with these things, that's another thing is be careful. Another thing you can do with the variegated wash, with, with really any wash for interest is you can tap clear water in and see what that does. It's changing it up and it's still wet. So that's going to mingle a little bit, but really there are your four basic washes that you can use over and over again. Um, think of these as the different notes that make up a chord in music. Um, and they'll be part of your toolbox going forward. Uh, a wash like this can be used, These maybe not these colors, but this technique can be used when you want to represent maybe a field of grasses and you don't want to get in there and paint every blade and it's got some vegetation. Starting with this underneath and then putting some texture on top can go a long way towards making it read as a field of grassy, marshy, meadowy, whatever you want without having to paint it so much. Um, and it gives it a nice painterly look without you actually having to futz with it too much. One of the great things about watercolor is, or one of the real secrets of watercolor is the more you can do simply and have it read as something, the better off you are. The less work you actually have to do and the more you can let the paint do the work for you, the cleaner and fresher and brighter your painting will be. Um, these are things that we'll talk about and figure out how to achieve together in the coming weeks during the class. So I hope you like this. Go ahead and practice these washes. Uh, the second video, the one that we'll have ready next week, will be from our second class, and it will be all about it will be all about um, 
value. We did that class on doing still lifes from three values, a light, a middle, and a dark tone from one color to describe the shapes and textures of subjects in a painting. Um, from there, we'll move on to adding color to it with complements, and then we'll start diving into colors. There's a lot of exciting stuff ahead. Uh, I hope each week that even if you can't come to my classes, but you're interested in starting watercolor, that you start with these beginner videos because they will help you a lot. That's it. I'll see you in the classroom or I'll see you here on the web.